Three, two, one. We decided to go across the country and find the most resilient entrepreneurs who strive to continue to succeed and disrupt every industry that they are in. From some great people. This is my work. That's we right. created this show. Why not you? To bring you closer to the minds of these disruptors. To motivate, <laughs> educate, and inspire you to become a disruptor in your own life. So welcome to the Disruptor Network. Season 2. What am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not meant to be here in front of all these people. What gives me the right to be here? Wait, wait a minute. Yes, I'm supposed to be here. I can do and be anything that I want as long as I put my mind to it. I am meant to be in any room that I step into. And I have been welcomed into an opportunity to choose to share who I am, to share my perspective, my experience, my passion, in hopes of uplifting, inspiring, and enabling another. This is my work. Let's rock. So I had early pursuits of pediatric neurosurgery, very early. I saw Ben Carson accept an award for being the first to separate Siamese twins from the brain. I was like, yo, he looks like me, he's well dressed, he speaks well. I looked up how much they get paid, yes, this is what I want to do. And so I had this dream from the time I was fourth grade all the way to sophomore year at Georgia Tech when I was pre-med biology. And then I started thinking to myself, man, neurosurgery. <laughs> I got to finish my bachelor's, I got to go through four years of medical, I had to do nine to 11 years of residency at that time before I could actually be a practicing official neurosurgeon. I was like, man, hey, I've talked to that fourth grader within me, why do you want to be a pediatric neurosurgeon again? And the reasons that I heard didn't necessarily resonate or I could see so many other paths to get me there besides all that schooling and all that time. And so I was like, you know what? Why don't I see about switching the major to something that I could finish with a bachelor's degree, still make good money, and still be able to help people and solve problems. And from what I could see about chemical engineering, it's something that I could get down with. My engineering degree, what I learned at Georgia Tech was how to think, how to solve problems, breaking them up into discrete parts, and of course, applying engineering principles that I learned during that time. But that how to think, how to solve problems, how to approach problems was something that engineering afforded me. I mean, it helps me now in my consulting work. I don't do like, you know, stereotypical engineering work anymore. I engineer hearts and minds <laughs> through inspiring them. But when I'm, you know, engaging with companies from a consulting basis, I always want to know, okay, what is the true root issue? What is the problem that we're looking to solve? And then what's the best way to go about solving that problem? And I think the way that I'm able to frame those things can be applied in any situation. I put this quote at the very beginning of my book. My mom implanted in me in a very young age the belief that I can do and be anything that I want. If I can dream it, I can be it. And that has been in my core from a very young age. And I think it's the reason that I've been able to do the things that I've done in my career. I mean, the nature of my work is, you know, enabling others to harness the power of emotion to grow through change and disruption. What change and disruption has happened over the past 18 months? Insane, all over the world, across many industries. So I think my message and what I offer was very, very relevant and timely. But I think the other aspect with all of the unrest, social unrest that we've been dealing with in this country, you start seeing people's eyes opening to the importance of having voices and people like me on stages. And more doors began opening because of that. I hear this from my bureau partners and like, man, Black speakers, y'all are hot right now. <laughs> it's like, what took so long? Like, I mean, we've always been here and we've always been awesome. <laughs> so at first I was like, man, what took so long? Why now? And I started to feel like, I don't know, funny about it. And then I'm like, you know what? Doors are opening. 
and I get to walk through, and I get to stand on stages in front of thousands of people in these corporations, and I get to share my message and my voice. And so I'm going to walk through that door, and I'm going to be me and share my message and be grateful that I can actually be on these stages and do that. So I'm, I'm to the mindset now where I don't really care the reason that someone's opening the door, because I'm gonna walk through it, I'm gonna do me. In a keynote engagement, it's all about sharing this mindset of change enthusiasm. And typically my clients are ones who are going through a lot of change and disruption, and there's a lot of unrest in the organization. Folks are anxious about what's around the corner. Folks are frustrated or angry with the new change that just came down. Folks are fearful. Folks are thinking the grass is greener. I need to jump ship. And so my message is really anchored in recognizing and acknowledging those emotions, and then letting folks know that they exist to serve you, they're a gift, they're signaling you into this great opportunity. With all this change that's happening in your company, you have an opportunity to become better, to become a better leader, a better innovator, and take advantage of this opportunity that's being presented to you. And it leaves everyone in the seat of choice. It's up to you to choose how do you maximize this opportunity. Now let's do this. Y'all kick the music back on. To a sense of excitement and enthusiasm for every major change challenge that you face and will truly enable you to serve as that point of inspiration. My keynotes are highly energetic in sharing this message. This is a big passion of mine because I have been through so much change in my professional life in corporate, going through two different acquisitions, being a part of cultures that got acquired and then had to kind of change, being a part of culture clashes, where again, us versus them, where I was just fed up and tired and frustrated, wanting to quit every single day. Every single day wanting to quit. And through creating this mindset, I didn't have language for it. It wasn't called change enthusiasm at the time. By starting to practice it though, I found places and went places in my career that I never thought I could go by putting this mindset into practice for myself. So that's why I'm so passionate about it because I know that it works. And it's been huge for me, not only in corporate, but also my entrepreneurial pursuits. You know, I firmly believe that we are emotional beings and we have this emotional energy for a reason. And I think we need to be using it in ways to, to grow, to evolve. But when we become these signal emotions, that judgment gets very clouded. And we might make decisions, make choices that don't necessarily resonate with our true authentic selves. And we're just on this anger, we see red, and we are gonna do this because we're acting, we become anger. And so it's important to really use these emotions as a tool that we separate as best we can our conscious thoughts from that emotional energy itself. Understanding who we are on a conscious level is the most important aspect of human life. After we start to grow conscious, the way that we look at life starts to clear up a little bit and the way that we react to situations starts to change a lot as well. Cassandra coined the term change enthusiasm and this is how she's bringing change into millions of people's lives. I really want to build and nurture the world's resiliency. If I could have every person on the planet a practicing change enthusiast, I did my work. Everyone who faces challenge, who faces hardship, to recognize within that is a lesson, is an opportunity, and that they are empowered to choose how they grow from that. If everyone on the planet is, is thinking that and constantly practicing that mindset, I've done my work. This is not about blind optimism. It's not about blind positivity. It's not about ignoring the really tough, difficult things. It's about acknowledging them, embracing them, granting ourselves grace. I'm feeling frustrated today, and that's okay. I know it, I acknowledge it, I'm giving myself grace. I'm gonna accept that I'm in a moment of opportunity, and maybe I'll choose how I grow tomorrow. But it's about acknowledging and accepting those emotions, not being blind to them, and allowing employees to emote, to let those emotions flow, let that energy flow, so then we can start transforming it into fuel for growth. Change enthusiasm is a practice, right? You don't get good at it. You don't really reach that enthusiasm about change until you're practicing it on a consistent basis. It doesn't happen immediately. And so in the practice of this, one of the things I talk about in the book is the power of patience and the importance of patience when you're going through tough change. It doesn't happen all at once. You have to be patient, continue to hold that trust and knowing that you're becoming better and you're evolving. One of my mentors before passing away had a phrase that he used to coin life into one sentence. He said that in life, the only constant is change. Meaning that you're never too old, but you're too successful in order to make a profound change in your life, to truly walk in your purpose 
and live in happiness. Our next example is someone that was extremely successful on Wall Street, but he wasn't too successful to change in order to really do what he's supposed to do. And now he inspires millions with his podcast all around the country.